I was at the Hilton Hotel in downtown Albany, not far from the Capitol building. It was about nine o'clock on a Thursday night, and I was there not as a guest, but to look for my wife. She was there with her boyfriend. She didn't know that I knew she had a boyfriend, but I did. I had known about it for some time, and it was gnawing at me, every day a little bit at a time, and I was going to do something about it. I thought long and hard about what I should do. A man can only take what he can take. For months I looked the other way, hoping her affair would end. But it didn't end. Diana continued her affair with Darren Ranger, all the while pretending to be a faithful and caring wife to me. We talked about our future plans and what we wanted to do. It was all a load of crap. She didn't mean any of it. I was trying to figure out what I had done to make her run to another man and want to have sex with him. Obviously, I was missing something. I obviously wasn't doing it for her anymore. At least not in the quantity or as often as she wanted. I tried to think of ways to let her have her fun for now and then get her back to being a faithful wife, but it was all just nonsense on my part. Once she got a taste for other men, it would be hard for her to come back to me. I waited a few months, but she gave no sign that she was going to change her ways. Then I decided it was better to just end it. I have to admit that it took me a while to come to terms with this decision. I work very long hours, often 18 hours a day for several days in a row. Was this the reason my wife turned her attention to another man to fulfill her needs? Was I unconsciously ignoring her? I didn't think so, but obviously something was wrong. But if I wasn't meeting her needs, why not talk to me about it? Why not just say, I need to move on and be done with it? Why have a boyfriend behind my back and yet say useless things like, I love you to my face? Why not do the mature thing and tell me you want to break up and get a divorce? Too many questions and not enough answers. So I came up with a plan. Maybe not a perfect one, but one that I can live with. I wasn't at the hotel to be violent. Hell, it wasn't worth it at that moment. I wasn't going to do something stupid and beat the crap out of her boyfriend. No, my lawyer had warned me against it and told me it would end badly. I'd end up in jail and get a criminal record. No, I was just there to end it. To put her out of her misery and maybe give her a few minutes of misery. You want to know a little bit about me, don't you? So my name is David Walters. I'm 31 years old, born and raised in the Albany area, and I work as a physician. I'm an emergency room physician, and I practice at the main hospital in town. Or at least I used to practice. I have a mother, father, and brother, all of whom live nearby. I also have a wife. I recently applied for a leave of absence to recuperate. I'm burned out. I admit it. I haven't told my wife about it because she doesn't care. My own doctor advised me to do this so I could properly recuperate and not die of stress early. I've been burning the proverbial candle at both ends and sometimes in the middle. I desperately need rest. After finding out that my wife was having fun with other men, I finally decided to take a break. My wife's name is Diane Walters, nay Stapleton. She's 30 years old, and she works for a national bank in the city. We live in a pretty nice two-bedroom apartment near the hospital, and we don't have children. Thank goodness for that. Diane's height is about 5 feet 8 inches. She has long, thick brunette hair that comes down below her shoulders, and she is very good-looking. She attracts men's attention very easily. Too easily. She's easy to look at. We met at university. I liked her from the very beginning. I met her in an English class I was taking in my second year. Science students had to be able to read not only technical literature, but also to understand it. My main focus in that class was Diane. I asked her out, and as they say, the rest was history. Until today. After university, Diane and I lived together for almost two years and got married right after I finished medical school. I managed to graduate without the huge debts that most medical students face. I was financed by mom and dad's bank. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. A poor little rich kid complaining and crying about his great misfortune. That's a load of crap. While I was in school, I worked damn hard every summer to earn as much as I could. My family helped me out by making me promise to pay my parents back when I graduated high school and started making money. Now my family is living well. My father has a construction and contracting business, and he is doing very well. He has over a hundred employees and a warehouse full of materials and equipment that he uses in his business. I worked for him as a laborer during the summer, earning minimum wage to pay for tuition for the next year. So I know a thing or two about hard work. Now I work 18-hour shifts at the hospital, and I'm on call on my off days. But you don't care about that, do you? You want to know what's going on with my wife at the Hilton. You want to know what I'm going to do with her. Well, that's about to happen. I've said before that I've known about her having a boyfriend for some time now. 
Why haven't I done anything about it yet? Well, that's a fair question. I have to say that I went through several stages of grieving the loss of my marriage before I decided what to do. Yes, at first I was stunned to realize that Diane was cheating on me. After all, I thought we were a team. I thought we had the same desires, aspirations, and plans. And then I find out she's hooking up with this Darren guy. What the hell? We talked about starting a family. We talked about what kind of kids we wanted. We even started thinking about names for them. Names for boys and girls, and we even looked at houses in the suburbs for crying out loud. We talked about her taking maternity leave at work once we had a baby in our family. We discussed the pros and cons of her becoming a stay-at-home mom and taking full care of the kids. Her own mother did the same for her, her brother and sister. We had already opened a savings account to put a down payment on the house and pay for baby expenses. My salary at the hospital was growing rapidly. Last year, they paid me $120,000. I paid my taxes and paid my parents back almost $10,000. Diane was paid well at the bank and was making about $80,000. We were in great financial shape and my job as an ER doctor had great earning potential. I would likely be making almost $600,000 a year in five years. We shared dreams. We made plans. We told each other every day that we loved the other person. I loved my wife and she loved me. At least I thought she loved me. Now not so much. What happened? I found out about Diana's affair quite by accident. A nurse from the emergency room was at a downtown restaurant on a date with her husband. She had met Diane the year before at a Christmas party at the hospital and being good with faces and names, remembered that she was my wife. She also recognized the guy she was with. We'll come back to him. I watched as Diane and her boyfriend walked through the hotel lobby and headed for the elevators. They entered one of them, and he turned to press the button for the floor he was renting a room on. I watched as the indicator light above the elevator stopped at the number 12. I sat down, looked at my watch, and considered my plan one more time. In the back of my mind, I knew that this was what I needed to do to make things right in my life. I can only tolerate so much disrespect, and today I will right this little injustice. Today I'm going to stir the pot. We'll see what happens. I walked up to the front desk and asked to call the room occupied by Mr. Darren Ranger. Mr. Ranger is the owner of a local business that does landscaping and property maintenance. Mr. Ranger lives very well for himself, his wife, and two sons. So well, in fact, that he has found it necessary to have an affair with the loan officer of the bank with which he does business. That loan officer happens to be my wife. Darren and Diane had been enjoying each other's attention for almost two full years. Yes, I couldn't believe it when I found out the extent of her infidelity. I found out quite by accident when one of the nurses in the emergency room was working the same shift as me and happened to mention that she had seen Diane and her friend Darren at a restaurant downtown. The nurse had been there with her husband and friends the previous weekend. That same weekend, I was working an 18-hour shift to deal with the shootings and stabbings we see all too often when alcohol and drugs are in full swing. She knew Darren because his company did retaining wall work for her husband in the backyard. There you go. So the cat was let out of the bag. When I was home a few days later, I casually mentioned to Diane that Rhonda had spotted her at a restaurant last week with a friend. I didn't mention that I knew it was Darren's, but I asked about the menu and the quality of the food, and maybe we should go there sometime. The pale expression on Diane's face quickly recovered and she said, that's fine, and left it at that. The following week, I did a few things. I talked to my father about what I could or should do if I suspected my wife was unfaithful. He was shocked that Diane could do something like that. I know he really liked her and expected us to have children soon. From our conversation, I derived a basic plan of action to protect myself. We had a long heart-to-heart -heart talk, and at the end, we agreed that he would not share information with my mother. I went to my supervisor at the hospital and shared the information with her as well. She agreed that I needed a vacation to deal with my shit. She was familiar with my wife, and I could tell by the look on her face that she was disappointed that Diane might have done something like this. But she also realized that it happened too often. We agreed that I could take a three-month vacation, and then we would review my work assignment. I even met with the in-house psychiatrist to talk with him and she agreed that the stress of my family situation required some time off to recuperate. My next assignment was to contact the investigative agency and have them find out what Diana had been up to. It only took them a week of digging, and they put together a clear picture of what she and Mr. Ranger were doing, where they were doing it, and how long they had been doing it. The hotels kept records, and for a reasonable monetary fee paid to a willing clerk, 
would make those records available to anyone interested. Not that there is a great statewide law about the confidentiality of hotel records. A $100 bill handed to the porter, known to the investigator, led to a history of Mr. Ranger's business at the hotel for the past two years. It seems he had rented a room there almost every week, regularly like clockwork. And almost always with the same woman. The clerk recognized the woman in the photograph as the one who had accompanied Mr. Ranger. The woman in the photograph was Diane. The next thing I did was go to the bank, interestingly enough, not the one my wife worked at, and withdraw every dime I could without closing the account I had there. I have my own credit card, so I didn't have to do anything. So, armed with the knowledge that my loving wife is a cheating bitch, I decided it was time to do something about it. I knew Diane would meet her boyfriend after work, have dinner, and spend a few hours in a hotel room. She thought I had a long shift at the emergency room that day and night. He needed to get home to his family so he didn't have to stay up late. That morning, as soon as she left for work, I packed up all the things I planned to take with me and then went down to the garage and started loading up the bike. I loaded a few things into my car, my used trusty Subaru Outback, and asked my dad to pick it up later that day and leave it at his house. I wasn't taking much, but I had everything I figured I would need for the next few months on the road. The rest of the day was spent sorting out the little things I wanted to take or get rid of. It was a strange day. There seemed to be a death in my family. In fact, it was the death of my marriage. My bike is a 2016 Honda Africa Twin, equipped with racks, fog lights, heated grips, navigation system, crash bar, and a few other items that make it perfect for long-distance travel. All I needed to take with me was a few changes of clothes, a toothbrush, rain gear, and an iPad. I planned to stay off the freeways and see the countryside. I decided that I would stay overnight in small budget hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, and eat at local establishments off the beaten path. I will make occasional rest stops in places where there is plenty to see and do. My father always told me that change is sometimes as good as rest. Well, if ever there was a time for change, this was that time. My plan was to make one lap of North America. I mapped out a route that would take me along the New England coast to Maine, then into Canada, to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, then by ferry to Newfoundland, with a landing at Porto Basque. I would tour the island and leave via Argentia, and then return via New Brunswick to Quebec, Ontario, and then west through the prairies and Rocky Mountains to British Columbia. From British Columbia, I planned to take the coastal highway south to San Diego, and then take a route through the mountains to the Midwest, and make my way back through the Midwest to Albany. I figured it would take me three months, maybe four, and by then I would be able to exercise the demons enough to move on with my life and get back to work. I seriously considered taking a job with Doctors Without Borders for a year or two, just for a change of scenery. I figured there had to be better places to do good work than an ER in Albany on a Saturday night. The GSW and stabbings were starting to get tiresome. One can only tolerate so much stupidity. Right now, first things first. I had a cheating wife to deal with. I walked up to the counter and asked to speak to Darren Ranger. The attendant picked up the phone and called his number. After a few rings, he answered. I took the phone from the clerk. I exhaled, just like that. May I speak to Diane Walters, please? He faltered. Ah, there's no one here by that name. You must have the wrong number. Just tell her there's been a death in her family. What? Ah, shit! I continued, raising my voice. Just tell her that her husband died. He died today. Tell her David Walters died today. There were no voices in the receiver, but I could hear noise in the background and muffled speech. I repeated, raising my voice a little. Just tell her her husband is dead. And then I hung up. When I handed her the phone receiver, the receptionist looked at me wide-eyed. I looked at her, smiled and thanked her, then turned and walked out of the hotel. My motorcycle was parked out front. I put on my gear and helmet and waited for a few minutes. Diana ran out of the hotel into the street. It was dark enough that she didn't see me or the motorcycle as she hurried out of there. She quickly got into a cab. I figured she was headed to our apartment. Her apartment now. I, on the other hand, was headed for freedom. Diana. Oh my God. Someone called and told Darren that David was dead. What the hell? I needed to get home right away. I got dressed as fast as I could and ran for the elevator. A few seconds later, I was outside and took a cab home. I got to the apartment building and ran inside. The elevator took forever to get to our floor. As soon as the doors started to open, I ran down the hallway and struggled to put the key in the lock. I ran inside and called out to David's. I searched all the rooms, but he wasn't there. I sat down at the table to catch my breath, and I felt my heart pounding. 
I rummaged through my bag for a cell phone to call his father, and then I saw an envelope on the table. My name was printed on the front. I picked it up and opened it. It contained a single piece of paper and David's wedding ring. Shit! He knows. I unfolded the piece of paper and read it. Diana, you can consider me dead. Our marriage, by all accounts, has been dead for a long time, and that's why I left. I took what I wanted, the rest is yours, and you can do what you want with it. I have notified the management company that I will no longer be living here, so you can decide whether you want to stay here or move. The choice is yours. Don't look for me. I'm on the road for a break from work, life, and your fun with Darren Ranger. It's clear to me that you're no longer interested in being married to me. Enjoy your life and I wish you all the best. David. One last thing. My attorney will contact you shortly and provide you with information that you may or may not use. That's your choice, too. Oh, shit. What am I going to do now? I never thought David would find out about Darren. Shit. Shit! There was nothing serious about the relationship with Darren. It was just fun. David works atrociously hard, and even when we do get to spend time together, it seems like a lot of things get in the way of our intimacy. Honestly, I was lonely for a man's touch. I knew that David would slow down at work, and when we had a predictable schedule, we would pick ourselves up and be just like every other married couple. I thought that eventually we would have a couple kids, buy a house, and become a normal family. That plan went to hell. Darren is a very charming guy, and it was easy to get infatuated with him. The more I thought about him, the easier it was to imagine that I could have him once or twice a week, and it wouldn't interfere with my marriage. I tried to call David on his cell phone, but found that his number was no longer in service. I called his mother and father and pounced on them. His father refused to talk to me, saying only that David had left and I could go to hell. I looked around the apartment again and saw that most of David's things were gone. The furniture was still there, but I noticed that his closet was empty. A few books from the shelf in the spare bedroom were gone, and there were a couple of black garbage bags in the kitchen. Opening them, I saw that they were David's things that he had obviously decided he didn't need. I had no idea what to do. I was sitting at my desk, and it felt like my life had evaporated before my eyes. I'd screwed up big time. I decided I would go to his family tomorrow and try to figure out what I'd gotten myself into. I tried calling a few of his friends but got nowhere. All they could tell me was that they thought he was busy at the hospital and that they hadn't seen him in weeks. No one at his brother's house answered and I didn't have any of their cell phone numbers. Damn! I went to the refrigerator, found half a bottle of wine, and poured it into a glass. I sat at the table, staring at the note and my husband's wedding ring, thinking about how stupid I was, and trying to think of a way to fix this. Whatever the fix was, it wouldn't come without pain on my part. I screwed up big time. David. That first night I hadn't traveled very far. It was almost 10 p.m. when I saw my wife run out of the Hilton Hotel and into a cab. She thought I was at work in the emergency room and would be there until tomorrow. She figured she would have plenty of time to spend with her boyfriend and then come home and clean up. I engaged the starter and the bike immediately came to life. The Africa Twin is a DCT. That means it has a programmable six-speed automatic transmission. It also means there is much less rider fatigue on long rides. The 1000cc bike is a beast. It can go for days at high speed and carry me and all my gear. I have no death wish, so I'm always very careful when I ride, looking at everything around me and anticipating what the cars and trucks will do. Situational awareness is really important for safe riding. I've seen a lot of kids brought to the emergency room who were going too fast on a crotch rocket and generally weren't good riders initially. This usually leads to a crash. I've seen kids killed because of stupid actions on a motorcycle and many others permanently crippled. Not a pleasant ending. The destination was only a few minutes away. It was east of the river at the Holiday Inn Express, just off the highway. I was exhausted physically and mentally. I wanted to eat, take a hot shower, and get a good night's sleep. I was checked into a room and I realized that the hotel was where my marriage ended. Now I was at the hotel starting my new adventure. How appropriate. How ironic. Diana. Leaving the apartment early, I drove to David's parents' house and rang the doorbell. I noticed that David's car was parked in front of the garage, so maybe he was here. Miriam, his mother, came to the door, and when she opened it and saw it was me, she immediately closed it in my face. I pressed the doorbell button again and waited. I kept pressing the button until a few minutes later the door opened, and this time it was John, David's father. He was just a wonderful man. What the hell do you want? Please, John, I need to talk to David. 
Please, I need to see him. Ask him to come out. John frowned. You're too late. He left Albany last night. I don't know where he is, and frankly, if I did, I wouldn't tell you. John, I need to talk to him and explain everything. If he just listens to me, I know we can work through this. What the hell? You've had a long-term affair with another man, and you expect your husband to just say, Oh, don't worry, honey, it's okay. Like he will. Get your cheating ass off my doorstep, and we don't want to see you here anymore. With those words, he slammed the door shut. I sat on the step for a few minutes, trying to figure out what to do. I rang the doorbell again. I kept ringing until John opened it. Before he could say anything, I blurted out, Please, give him a message from me. Tell him I'm desperate to talk to him. Just ask him to call me. Please. I turned and walked back to the car and sat for a few minutes, hoping John would tell me how to contact David, or if he was in the house, come out, but he didn't. He closed the door and that was the end of it. Nothing more. I returned to the apartment and found a letter taped to the door. It was a letter from David's attorney, Leanne Collins, informing me that I had been dropped from David's health insurance policy and all financial assets had been divided equally and David's portion withdrawn from all bank accounts. In addition, the life insurance policies have been amended so that the beneficiaries are now his parents. The letter also advised that David Walters did not wish to have any further contact with Diane Walters, and therefore any correspondence that Diane Walters may wish to send to David Walters should be in writing and sent to his attorney. Any correspondence will be held until such time as David Walters indicates that he wishes to receive it. The letter went on to say that under New York State family law, Diane Walters has the right to sue for dissolution of marriage on the grounds of abandonment after one year, which will be 365 days from this date. If Diane Walters wishes to file for dissolution of marriage at any time, have her representative contact Leanne Collins. Any necessary motions or pleadings on behalf of David Walters will be filed at that time. Have a good day. So it became clear that my husband was done. We had been together for almost eight years, married for almost four of them, and that was the end of it. I had already pooped in my own bed, and now I had to lie in it. I spent the entire weekend trying to reach David's brother, his friends, his co-workers at the hospital. I even went to the hospital to try to find someone there who could tell me where David might be. I met an emergency room nurse there. Her name is Rhonda. She told me that she couldn't talk to me because she was very busy, but I could come see her the next day and we could talk. I thanked her and left. The next day I went to the address she gave me and she actually let me in to talk. She offered me a drink. I asked for ice water. I needed to clear my head. She told me that she had shared with David that she had seen me at the restaurant with Darren. She said he was interested to know more about this Darren. Rhonda said she told him everything she knew about him, which wasn't much, but he was married, had a family, and his company did landscaping in her backyard. There wasn't much more to tell. She looked at me with a mixture of amazement and pity. I'm sure she thought I was a stupid idiot and had ruined my marriage to a married man, no less. As we talked, her kids ran in and out of the kitchen. She shouted at them every now and then and returned her attention to me. After asking a few more questions, I thanked her for her time and got up to leave. As I walked out the door, she mentioned that it was widely known at the hospital that David wouldn't be returning to work for a while. She stared after me as I got in my car and drove away. A month later, David. Newfoundland is a beautiful province. It has majestic scenery and very nice people. I was on the island for over a week, traveled many roads and really enjoyed the scenery, people and food. When I got to the Avalon Peninsula, I was confronted by a moose that decided to come out onto the road to see who I was. I managed to avoid the giant and stopped to watch him for a few minutes while he decided that maybe the road wasn't the right place for him. Good for him and good for any unlucky motorist who might have run into him. I had been warned that there were a lot of moose along the highway, so I only drove during the day. I was in a place called Petty Harbor, eating ice cream after visiting the easternmost part of North America, Cape Spear, and I got a flat tire on my bike. Four different people offered to help me. You don't see that in Albany? I called the auto club, CAA in Canada, and they sent a truck to load my bike on it and take me to a repair shop. The repair shop was in St. John's S, a fairly large city with a good selection of places to stay and great restaurants. I got a room in a small hotel in the center of town and went for a walk around town while my bike was being repaired and tuned up. It was a good place to take a break from riding, do laundry, and recharge my batteries. The hotel room was clean and comfortable, and it even had a small bar and restaurant. I stopped by the motorcycle repair shop again to have them do a modification for me, and while I was there, 
I happened to meet a woman who was also traveling across the country on a motorcycle. She was from Germany and was on her way to Morocco. She had traveled through Canada and was now heading to Africa to begin her journey around the continent. She was preparing her motorcycle for shipment from St. John's in a shipping container. She would fly to Casablanca via Lisbon and pick up the bike as soon as she arrived. It should have taken about a week to get the bike to Morocco. Her name was Emma Fisher. She was originally from Berlin and worked for a travel company. She was dressed in riding gear, and although it wasn't the most flattering outfit, I immediately knew she was gorgeous. In my opinion, she was about 30, 35 years old and about the same height as me. My height is 5'11", and I stand barefoot. She looks like that British actress who does the Mission Impossible movies, only with a sexy German accent. After talking some more about traveling by motorcycle and some of the things she had encountered on her journey across Canada, I asked when she was leaving, and it turned out to be only in three days. Then I asked her out to dinner. She said yes. We were staying in hotels fairly close to each other and agreed to meet at a restaurant called The Salty Cod. Wow, an establishment by that name in Newfoundland. We ate, drank, got to know each other, and the next morning I woke up in my hotel bed with a hand on my chest and a mane of dark hair spread across the pillows. She was gorgeous. I felt, well, it's hard to find the words to convey how good I felt. It was the best night I'd had in a while. For the first time in a long time, I felt good. We spent the whole next day together, talking a lot about traveling and how exciting it was to travel the world on a motorcycle. Her smile, her voice, and her eyes attracted me. I was immediately drawn to her. I got an erection at the mere sight of her. I was overcome with lust. After I shared my story with her and she shared hers, we talked about what we each had planned for the next few months. My plans, of course, included driving across North America. She had already driven almost 40,000 kilometers and planned to drive another 20,000 before heading home to Germany. Her plan was to drive around the coast of Africa. I thought it would be a much more interesting trip than the one I had planned. All the next day, while I spent time with Emma, I thought about the pros and cons of changing my plan. I even called my father and talked to him to let him know that I was thinking about going to Africa. I figured he might think I was out of my mind if I just texted him and my mom that I was going to Africa and would see them later. We talked for almost an hour. At the end of the conversation, both he and mom said that I should do whatever I want. This is my life, and I should make my own decisions about the path it will take. When I was a kid, my father used to tell me that fathers are where their children's dreams go to die. I didn't realize this until I grew up, and then I always thought it was a humorous but sadly realistic phrase my father used to say to me and my brother. Yes, I have a brother. He's two years older than me and married with three kids. He works with my dad at a construction company. Paul loves to build. He works very hard for his family and his wife shows him respect for his hard work. Marcy quit her job to raise her children at home and I have to tell you, I think it has paid off for them. She is a wonderful mother and my parents love her to death. Their children are spoiled by their grandparents. But I digress. Let's get back to my plan. The next night I asked Emma if she wanted some company on her journey through Africa. I didn't know if she had a boyfriend, husband, or soulmate she was going to meet, but I decided to play a little game and asked anyway. He who dares wins. She looked at me with a smile and asked, Are you saying you want to come to Africa? She says bluntly. Yes, it is. What happened to your plan to travel North America? Well, you've opened my eyes a little bit, and I think Africa might be a more interesting place to visit. It's a little out of my comfort zone, but I think I need to challenge myself and see what happens. Maybe I'll do well, or maybe it will be terrible. Right now, I don't really know. But I think I'd like to find out. I'm still too close to Albany. I need some distance from my old life. You have an immediate problem. Your motorcycle is here and needs to get to Africa. I quickly called the store and asked if there was room in the shipping container for another motorcycle. The store owner called me back an hour later and said that if I could get there now and sign some paperwork, he could have my bike ready to ship the next morning. The logistics of shipping a motorcycle are pretty simple, but all it takes is enough money. Two days later, I boarded a flight from St. John's to Toronto with Emma. From there, we flew to Paris, and then after a short wait, to Lisbon and Casablanca. Emma Fisher When David talked about wanting to join me on the African part of my trip, I decided I needed to find out more about him before agreeing. I made a couple calls to a friend from the office I work in back home in Berlin. Her husband works for the German police, and she asked if he could make some inquiries about one David Walters from Albany, New York, and confirmed that what he had told me about himself was true. My friend called me back very quickly, 
and informed me that he was, as they say, the real deal. He worked as a physician in the emergency room at Albany General Hospital and was on sabbatical leave for three months with a possible extension to six months. He comes from a prominent family in Albany and is currently divorced from his wife of nearly four years. It appears she was having an affair with a married man. He graduated from medical school among the top of his class and has no children. It's amazing what the police can dig up without much effort. I even got a picture of him to make sure it was indeed the David Walters I was asking about. It was him, all right. Withholding this information, I was glad to be traveling with David. The fact that he was a doctor was good to know in case we had an accident and needed medical attention. But at the same time, I knew that he must be suffering greatly from his wife's infidelity to leave for such a long period of time and travel alone. I had a long-term partner, a man, and I can tell you that being cheated on by your partner is not something that can be tolerated for long. I ended my relationship by throwing all his stuff on the balcony of our apartment. He got the message. I can tell you that traveling alone is different. You can go wherever you want and whenever you want. But it can also be lonely. I have been on this journey for a few months now and have traveled over 30,000 kilometers. I plan to write a book about motorcycle travel from the perspective of a woman traveling alone. I've been taking photos and videos of every part of this journey, as well as keeping a detailed written diary, and it will probably take me a few months to edit it all and make it into something I can sell. I may be interested in doing all this, but it has to be interesting enough for others to pay money to read about my adventures. I have a friend back home who suggests I put some of my videos online, maybe on YouTube or some other social networking site. David has a lot to learn about hardcore, long-distance motorcycle travel, and the first task is to supply him with the best gear he has. I called a motorcycle store in Casablanca, and they have almost everything he needs, and they know of other stores and outfitters in the area that can provide more things he'll need. It will be interesting to travel with Dr. David. I hope I can be a good tour guide. Diana. David's mother and father have made it clear that they want nothing more to do with me. They refuse to talk to me and won't tell me where David is. I don't know what to do about my marriage. It's becoming obvious that David and I are over, so what should I do? He hasn't started the divorce yet, and I'm not sure if I want to be the first to file for divorce. What if he comes back and changes his mind and wants to try to repair our marriage? What will I do if he gives me another chance? What will I do then? Will he be able to trust me again? I felt very lonely after Darren told me that we couldn't see each other anymore. His wife started to suspect something, and he was afraid that she might have hired an investigator to get evidence of his affair with me that she could use to punish him in the divorce. So that was over and done with. Besides, he was afraid that David might have told his wife that he was having fun with me. My social life is very modest, almost non-existent. But I can't take it anymore. I need to get out of the house. I need to see people and socialize. People at work often meet on Fridays after work. I'm going to start walking with them. The walls of the apartment are starting to cramp me. I really need a change of scenery. David? Casablanca is an amazing place. Casablanca, Arabic for Aldar al Baida or Dar al Baida, is Morocco's main port, located on the North African coast of the Atlantic Ocean. The city is home to about 4 million people and is an interesting mix of very old and very new and modern. I got us an inexpensive hotel room to stay in while we waited for the ship to arrive with our bikes. Emma drove me to a few places to purchase the necessary gear and we played tourist, walking around the city, eating food and learning about the history and culture. We learned that the ship was delayed two days due to bad weather in the Atlantic and we ended up staying in Casablanca for eight nights. Some of those nights were the best nights of my life. The others kept up. Diana. Almost two months and no word from David. I need to start figuring out what to do. It looked like he was serious about getting rid of me. What did I do that was so wrong? I mean, he was never there for me. This damn hospital was the only thing he cared about. He has me alone and he should have been there to take care of my needs too. I love him, but with his schedule and my schedule, we had very little time together. I have needs too. Darren actually stopped by the bank yesterday to see me. He figures his wife is no longer suspicious of what he does when he's not in the office, and we can start seeing each other again. When I told him that my husband left me, all he replied was that we could save on hotel bills by using my apartment. I need to get a man in me again soon or I'm going to go crazy. I was hoping it would be David, but without him, I may have to make do with Darren. Damn it. David. I can't believe the beauty of Morocco. I also can't believe the beauty of Emma. The more I learn about her, the more I like her. 
Not only is she physically beautiful, but she's also very smart, resourceful, drives a motorcycle beautifully, has tons of common sense and is not afraid to use it. She taught me a lot about real adventure riding. She told me that she has a longtime boyfriend, referred to at home as a common-law husband, and she has no children. Her boyfriend decided he wanted to live with another woman and announced in a very correct manner that their relationship was over. She threw his crap over the railing of the apartment balcony and moved on with her life. In Casablanca, I bought a bunch of new equipment I needed to survive in these conditions. I now have a supply of gasoline and oil for my motorcycle. Plenty of water for me. Tools for repairs like fixing a flat tire or a broken chain. My bike has metal covers on the underside of the engine and extra LED headlights. I also have a battery and cables for recharging, since none of our bikes have a Kickstarter. I have a new GPS system that detects even off-road routes and connects via satellites rather than cell phone signals. I have the best riding gear, a sleeping bag, and an inflatable pillow to sleep on for those nights when we stay in campgrounds away from towns and villages. I also have a small gas stove to heat water and food. I can even make coffee, which is a big deal. We plan to stay in small bed and breakfast inns as often as possible and eat local food. This proved to be interesting when we arrived in Morocco. My North American gut wasn't quite ready for the change in diet, and for the first few days I had to stay close to the restroom. Emma found this very amusing, as she was used to eating from all sorts of places. I bought some pills to help with my bowel movements. My med school training had taken its toll, and I remembered that dehydration is not your friend. I drank more water and all was well. I received a letter from my attorney to let me know that nothing was going on with Diane. She has been quiet and hasn't tried to send me anything. I guess she realized it was over between us, or was trying to figure out what her options were and what she was going to do. I didn't care at all what she was doing. I only knew that what I was doing now was what I wanted. I didn't want a wife who wanted to spend time with another man. Hell, if she wanted another guy, why not just tell me that and we could go our separate ways? But no, she couldn't be honest with me. She was supposed to be having fun with that landscaping guy. She had to pretend she still cared about me. What a load of crap that was. After leaving Casablanca, we drove south towards Marrakesh. It's about 250 kilometers on the main highway, the A3, but we decided to take a more indirect route through the port city of El Hadida. It was a hot day, but it was a great ride, and we enjoyed getting there on less direct roads. The town of El Jadida was very beautiful. We spent one night there and then traveled to El Baduza, a town on the coast. Because it is so close to the water, the temperature there was a little cooler than inland, so I was able to acclimatize to that kind of terrain. Emma had never been here before, so it was a time for both of us to discover the region. Emma knows several languages. German, English, French, Spanish, and a little Arabic. In the short time we'd been in North Africa, she'd managed to use them all. God, I love her German accent. It's sexy as hell. The journey from Casablanca to Marrakech took us five days and over 1,300 kilometers. It was, without a doubt, the best trip of my life. Safi and Essaouira were on our itinerary, and then we traveled east inland to the big city. Marrakech is a city of about a million people. It is an amazing place, again combining old and new. Since neither of us had been there, I convinced Emma that we should stay for three days and play tourist. So we did. I was able to find an inexpensive hotel in town that had secure parking for our bikes. I didn't want them to be stripped of everything or stolen. We checked the bikes every day and everything was fine. Emma rode a BMW F800GS, and it was equipped with everything BMW can think of to make long-distance travel easier. I may come up with some of that later, but for now the Africa Twin was doing just fine here in Africa. Diana. It's been over two months now and I haven't heard from David or anyone he knows. I tried several more times to talk to his family, but each time I got a door slammed in my face. I called his attorney, but all she asked was if I was starting divorce proceedings or if I had a letter I wanted him to receive at some point. I didn't write a letter, and what the hell was I supposed to put in it? I wasn't going to get a divorce yet. I still wanted to talk to David and see if he was okay with staying married to me. After all, he's a great husband, and I know he'll be a great father when we have kids. If we have kids... But right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I've had several different guys in my apartment for one night. Does that make me a bad person? Probably yes, but maybe not. After all, my husband left me and went God knows where. No call, no text, no email to tell me what he's doing and when he'll be back. It would be nice to hear from him. David. Africa is so different from anything I grew up with. 
The culture, the language, the terrain, the food, the weather, everything. But at the same time, it is remarkably similar to home. The people here are pretty much the same. People want to take care of their families and homes. They want to make sure they have food on the table and a roof over their heads. Just basic survival. Parents want a better life for their children. They want peace and security. Not every country on this continent has a stable government whose goal is the welfare of the people. In Morocco, the situation is better than in many other countries. Traveling with Emma was very educational. She is a real woman with an extraordinary sense of adventure. She is clearly unhappy unless she is challenged. I, on the other hand, am being challenged to give up my own fears of different things, places, and environments. I grew up in fairly safe New York State in a very stable family with a mother, father, and brother. I went to a good school and came home to a cozy and safe home. Not every family in the world can boast such luxury. One thing I have realized since I went on sabbatical is that people all over the world depend on their families and friends and take pride in the place where they live, no matter how humble it may be. Africa is a learning experience. Traveling is a learning experience. My eyes are being opened in ways I never imagined. And I am experiencing it with a remarkable woman. Emma is a wonderful companion and lover. She is passionate, caring, wild, and loves living on the edge. That doesn't mean she's stupid, just the opposite. She has a lot of common sense and is not afraid to use it. I'm overcome with lust. Lust for Emma and travel. Lust for a new way of life. I don't think I can go back to the lifestyle I had in Albany. Emma Fisher. I really enjoy being with Dr. David on this Africa trip. He is such a pleasure to be around. He is constantly amazed at the difference in things and life in Africa compared to his upbringing in the U.S. He has worked so hard to do the right things his whole life. University, medical school, family, and wife. And all of this led to his disappointment with the one person he thought would be with him forever. He thought his wife would support him in his profession and in the choices they made together. But she lost her way somewhere. I don't know her, and my mission is not to take her husband away from her. But from the looks of it, she did a good job of leaving him, and all by herself. We've only been together for a few weeks, but I can tell that if things continue the way they are now, we're going to have a hard time breaking up when he has to go back to work at the hospital. I have a plan that I made before I started my adventure, and I have to see it through. I have committed to a publishing house back home to write a guidebook for women who want to see the world on a motorcycle. I doubt I'll make much money from it, but I'm enjoying it. It's something I enjoy doing. And I think I'm good at it. David, we are on our way from Marrakech to Layoun. It's about 900 kilometers, and we are driving mostly on the coastal route. There is almost nothing on the long stretches, just dust and wide open spaces. The beauty is breathtaking and awe-inspiring at the same time. A greenhorn like me has to respect the environment and pay attention to what's going on around me. My American passport doesn't entitle me to much here. A passport issued by an EU member country is well recognized here. Border guards are often perplexed as to why an American is in a place like this and riding around on a motorcycle getting dirty. One customs officer asked me why I left America and came here. I smiled and pointed to Emma. He laughed, nodding his head. He knows why men do that. On the way to El Ayun, we camped for two nights. We made sure we were far from the road and would not be an easy target for night thieves. I must say that the first night I hardly slept at all. Every noise kept me awake and on high alert. On the second night, fatigue set in and I started sleeping more. In the morning, after some ablutions had been performed and coffee brewed on the stove, I felt much better. Motorcycle gasoline, water, and food were a priority for us, so we never passed a place to fill up and buy food. We always paid cash and never put down more than what the gas and groceries cost. It's best not to make a target of yourself. Not to say that West Africa is a dangerous place, no more dangerous than some parts of the U.S., but it never hurts to be aware of your surroundings and realize that two people on expensive motorcycles must have some money on them, so they are immediately a target for a thief looking to make an easy buck. My equipment protects me from falls, but it is no match for a gun or knife. I know full well the damage a tiny gun can do. I've seen it too many times in the ER at my house. Great entertainment! The trip south through Western Sahara and Mauritania was unlike anything I'd ever seen or experienced in my life. The landscape was like the moon must have been. It was dry, dusty, brutal, and beautiful all at the same time. As we drove, we were able to talk to each other through Bluetooth helmet communication devices. Emma kept telling me about the region as if she had lived here for years. 
She was the editor of a travel magazine and had researched the area very well before leaving home. It was all amazing to me. I loved it, but at the same time I was scared to death. Scared because it was so foreign to my white American upbringing. Did I mention that Emma talked nonstop? Her voice was mesmerizing. I could listen to that woman read the Berlin phone book. I swear I got a boner while I was riding my bike, all because of her voice. Our goal after leaving La Yun was to get to Dakar in Senegal. It was over 1,800 kilometers. This meant four days of pretty intense driving. I had managed to increase the distance, but now had to cover it in the heat and dust. Dust everywhere. Emma reminds me to drink water about 10 times a day. I have a camelback flask that holds four liters of water, and I empty it every day plus more when we finish. A few times I've had to stop to empty my bladder on the side of the road, but it makes me laugh when Emma has to do the same. I tried to take a picture of her squatting to pee. It didn't work. She chased after me and snatched the phone out of my hands. I was laughing so hard I was having trouble breathing. I could tell you about the trip through Western Sahara and Mauritania, but that would be repeating the same thing four times. Lots of wide open spaces with absolutely nothing on them. I've mentioned before that we never once passed a place to buy gasoline. We both carried an extra 10 liters of fuel on our motorcycles, and we had to use it a couple of times. My motorcycle is a little bigger in engine displacement, so it uses a little more gasoline than Emma's BMW. I'm going to buy an extra gas tank to attach to the bike. We had a breakdown and had to repair on the side of the road. It cost us about three hours, but that's the price you pay. We spent three nights in the tent, and it's just amazing how you can be intimate with a woman when you haven't had a chance to shower beforehand. The smell of human body odor when it had been hot and sweaty all day was something I was used to. Making love to Emma in a tiny tent in the desert after several such long days with no water to take a bath was different. But it was still amazing. Neither of us went near certain parts of the other's body with our mouths, but our hands were there. I know it sounds gross, but that's life. And sex. And maybe the beginning of love. We did a little bit of washing. A little water and soap on a washcloth to wash all the necessary body parts, and we used a cup of water each to brush our teeth. Cleanliness is... Well, you get the picture. We crossed the Senegalese border at Diama. The crossing at Rosso is much more complicated and requires paying money to just about everyone who has any control over the crossing to get to the other side of the river. We learned from other bikers that there is a bridge at Diama, and crossing it is less costly. Not too far from the bridge is the city of St. Louis. This is not the St. Louis you are most likely familiar with. It's very different. I knew from research beforehand that the city is divided into different parts, some of which are on islands. When we arrived in the city, it looked like something I had only seen in movies. The poverty was astounding. However, as we drove over the bridge, we saw another part of the city that clearly had money. We found a nice and inexpensive hotel, Hotel de la Poste, secured our bikes and cleaned up. The hotel was next to a large government building, so there was always a police presence nearby. This meant there was much less crime in the area. Good for us. I told Emma that I needed some rest after crossing the desert. She laughed her infectious smile and agreed that we could both use a decent bed to sleep in. We spent the next two days in that bed. At times we got very little sleep. We went out for food a few times and swam in the hotel pool. The hotel even has a laundry room, so we got our clothes in order. I know what you're thinking. A rich guy from the U.S. can buy anything he wants in Africa. Well, most of the big houses in this part of St. Louis are owned by Senegalese, not Westerners. So park your outrage. Also, everything is a little cheaper in this part of the world than in the U.S. $50 a night for a nice hotel room that would cost $200 in the States is not uncommon. I usually checked my email when I had a good Wi-Fi connection. I wanted to see if my family had sent me anything and if my lawyer wanted to pass anything on to me. It was mostly my mom and dad asking where I was, if everything was okay and if I was having a good time. This time the lawyer gave me an update. It seems Diane had written a letter asking where I was and when I would be back in Albany. I asked my parents not to report my whereabouts and my attorney was under strict orders to do the same. She told me that Diane had not yet initiated any divorce action. I figured she would file for divorce soon. After all, she was the one who needed sex outside of our marriage, and she had already been having fun with her boyfriend for two years. Two years. What I was doing now was none of her damn business. As far as I was concerned, it was over between us. Finished. I planned that if Diane didn't file for divorce before I got home from my trip, I would. I wanted to move on. 
I was having the best time of my life right now. Emma is a wonderful woman. I don't know what the future holds for us. She has plans, and they don't necessarily include me. But that's okay. Our meeting in Canada happened completely by chance. But it's a wonderful accident nonetheless. Emma Fisher After a wonderful two days at the hotel in St. Louis, we had to hit the road again. Our goal was Dakar, which was only 300 kilometers away. At the exit of the city, our plans quickly changed. A big problem loomed ahead. A bus had overturned on the road right in front of us. It looked like a scooter with a family of five and a propane tank on the side had hit a huge pothole and flipped over in front of the bus. The bus veered sharply, but that's when the driver hit the truck and the whole thing flipped on its side. After a momentary, oh shit, we pulled the bikes to the curb and took off our helmets. David ran to the front of the bus and started looking for the family on the scooter. What he discovered was horrifying to most of us. The family had been thrown from the scooter and the father was pinned under the wreckage of the bus. The children were all bleeding and the mother was lying unconscious on the ground. The damn propane tank was jammed underneath her as it appeared that she and the tank had rolled over several times. David quickly set to work on the mother as it appeared she had the most trauma. David started yelling to me to help with the kids and then to a few other people to go check to see if the father was alive or dead. I took our first aid kits off the bike and handed them to David. He was very calm and focused, working on the mother and her children. The father was barely moving, and it was obvious that he was going to need a lot more strength than we could give him to get him out from under the fender of the bus. Finally, the police showed up, but they did little except direct traffic. David yelled for them to call an ambulance, but they looked at him like he had two heads. An ambulance? Here? There were thankfully only a few people on the bus, and they slowly made their way out with cuts and bumps. The bus driver was bleeding from a head wound. He would need a few stitches. The policeman finally moved, and with the help of an iron bar tried to lift the bus a little so that the father could be pulled out. When they got him out, he was in a bad way. David was preoccupied with him and kept asking if an ambulance was coming. Finally, two ambulances showed up, and the mother and father and three children were loaded into the car and taken to the hospital. David and I were sitting on the side of the road drinking water. David was looking at the cuts and bruises the people on the bus had received. One of the police cars had taken the bus driver away, probably to the hospital. We didn't know for sure, but it wasn't our problem. One of the policemen with a lot of rank under his belt came over to talk to David. He spoke fairly good English. He asked David a few questions with a lot of hand gesturing and nodding. I couldn't hear what the conversation was about, but I soon found out. The policeman wanted to know why David was giving first aid to the wounded. When David explained that he was a doctor, the officer stepped back and spoke on his cell phone. He nodded his head for another long time and then turned back to David and asked if he could follow him. The hospital asked that David stop and tell them a little about the family's injuries on the scooter. The hospital didn't seem to have a doctor at the moment, and all they had were a few nurses who were very busy at the moment. We got on our bikes and followed the police car to the hospital. It certainly wasn't the kind of hospital I was used to seeing in Europe, but it wasn't horrible either. The building was old and in need of updating, but it looked clean enough and there was no trash in the hallways. The nurse David was talking to waved her hands and told him that they didn't have the capacity to take on another patient. David looked around and found everything he needed to stitch up some cuts on the children and then asked me to help him. I had no idea what to do, but he was very good at explaining to me what I needed to do to help him. Stitching is very easy. The hardest part is getting the curved needle through the skin. Once you do it a couple times, it's no problem. I helped David for what seemed like a very long time, but I know it only lasted a couple hours. The sight of blood was unfamiliar to me, but it's amazing what you can do when you need it. David was amazing. I couldn't believe what he had done. I had almost forgotten he was a doctor until he ran up to the scene of the accident and started shouting instructions to people. When danger arises, most people run from it. David ran towards it. Oh my God. We spent another three days in St. Louis. David spent most of that time at the hospital, where he saw several patients, both from the scooter and bus accident and many others who had been brought to the hospital. I learned from a nurse that rumors of a doctor seeing patients at the hospital spread quickly. This means that many of those who do not see a doctor may get the opportunity to have their problem brought to their attention. The man worked for over 30 hours without a break. I went back to the hotel to get some rest and clean up. David needed another night to rest and get ready for the road. When we left town, we were a little sad because we knew that now the people there would not have a regular doctor they could count on for help. 
David. The return south brought new adventures. Our planned stop was Dakar. I had read a bit about it on Wikipedia and was eager to see the city. Dakar is the capital of the Republic of Senegal and is home to about 4 million people. I was struck by the contrasts of the city. There was a lot of obvious wealth in the city, but there were also areas of rampant poverty. It seemed strange to see expensive Mercedes Benzes and shabby scooters in the same traffic. But they seemed to coexist without much open hostility. People were in the business of surviving. Families had to be fed and housed, and for that you had to go to work. That was life. It was no different than any other place I had seen since leaving Albany. It was just that now my eyes were open, and very much so. Perhaps I had Diane to thank for that. Maybe her inability to keep her legs closed to other men was the impetus that allowed me to see a whole new world, one that had been foreign to me before. Every day I was getting a better understanding of what was involved, with Emma as my guide and partner. I insisted that we get a hotel on the beach. So far, we'd been splitting the cost of the hotels and lodgings we'd stayed in. But I knew Emma's finances were limited. At least that was the impression I got from our conversations. So I told her I needed a vacation after my experience in St. Louis. I had the money, and at that point, I wasn't worried about the cost. So we stayed for three days, played tourist, and spent some time at the beach. It was wonderful. Emma told me that traveling with me made her very happy. I told her that she was quietly saving my life, giving me a new life. But then reality intervened. I checked my email and got this. From Chief Administrator, Albany General Hospital. To Dr. David Walters. David, we hope you enjoyed your leave from your hospital duties and that you are rested and ready to return to work. We have agreed on three months with the possibility of extending it to six months, but only if we and you mutually agree. Unfortunately, I have to inform you that you must return here as soon as possible, but at the latest by the first of next month. Your coworker is sick, so the emergency room needs you back at work. I can cover the shortage of doctors for a few weeks, but suffice it to say, we need you back here as soon as possible. Let me know if you have any problems and I will do my best to help. Call me when you receive this, please. David, I'm sorry to disrupt your plans, but we really need you. So wherever you are, please get your ass home. Laura. Dr. Laura Johnson, Chief Administrator. Well, shit. All good things come to an end sometime, and this adventure was another victim of reality rearing its ugly head and biting me in the ass. I decided I could ignore the email for a few days and continue the trip. So that's what I did. Emma Fisher? The journey south was going to be very difficult and, frankly, much more dangerous. Especially since David told me that he had been told to go back to the United States and return to his work at the hospital. We talked about me going home to Germany when he needed to go home. I then suggested that we ride a little further south to Namibia and ride from Windhoek to Cape Town. We contacted a bike store in Dakar that had contacts to ship our bikes by air and arranged to have them loaded on a cargo plane in two days. That's what we did. The flight to Windhoek was memorable because the airplane was old and the pilot and co-pilot looked like nothing more than teenagers. The weather during the flight was very windy. We were glad to get down on the ground at the Windhoek airport and see our motorcycles. We sorted out the equipment, paid the curators so nothing was accidentally lost and hit the road. The trip south to Cape Town took only five days. We both knew that the end of our time together was approaching fast, so we tried to make the most of that time. The sex with David was fantastic. I fell in love with him. He's the hero of my books. I didn't want to part with my hero, but I had to get back to work. I needed to start writing a book and editing hundreds of hours of video. The publisher was anxious to see some progress, and the money they'd given me was running out. I needed to go home and do things there. David arranged for us both to fly to Frankfurt, and there we parted ways. He would fly to JFK Airport in New York, and I would take the train to Berlin. There was a direct train from the airport to Berlin, which takes about five hours. David planned to take the subway from JFK Airport to the city and then take the train from Penn Station to Albany. He would take a cab to the hotel. On the day of our last night, we turned in our bikes to a bike store. Mine was sent to storage and David's was sent back to the U.S. It was a sad day for me and I could see that David didn't want to go home. At the Frankfurt Airport, we were very quiet. I looked at him and he looked so sad. His eyes spoke for themselves. I kissed him and told him he had to catch the next flight. He returned the kiss and whispered in my ear that he loved me. I realized that this was not the last time I would see this wonderful man. Albany, New York. Dave! Dave! It was my brother Paul yelling to me. 
I was standing in the hotel lobby looking around, trying to figure out where he was. It was my second day back in the U.S. after leaving Africa. Holy shit, bro. You're looking good. Where the hell have you been? Overseas. Hey, how did you know I was here? No. I have a client meeting here in a few minutes. Dad and Mom said you were taking a break from work and your wife. They never told me or Marcy where you went. What the hell is going on with Diane? It's a long story. So, you're coming to my house for dinner tonight, and you're going to tell me what the hell is going on and what you've been up to. I didn't argue with him. I guess it was time to get back to life here at home. Okay, thanks. A good home-cooked meal would be great. We chatted some more, and then I told him I had to go to the hospital to see my boss. Paul pulled out his cell phone and, I'm sure, called Marcy to tell her I was coming over for dinner. Next on his list would be Mom and Dad. I hadn't asked him not to call Diane, but I was pretty sure he wouldn't. It was a short walk from the hotel to the hospital, and it was a beautiful morning. Strangely, on the way to the hospital, I passed the building where Diana worked. The hospital administrator, Dr. Johnson, was happy to see me and even told me that she had received a strange letter from the Senegalese government through the U.S. State Department thanking me for the services rendered by an American doctor coming to St. Louis. She was very curious as to what this was all about, and I told her the story of the family on the scooter. Father, mother, three children, and a propane tank. She thought it was all very strange. I guess the letter was their way of thanking me for my help at the hospital. The ambulance chief briefed me on what was going on and then put me on the schedule. I'll start tomorrow and work 12-hour shifts for the next six days. That's great. Those 12-hour shifts easily turn into 18-hour shifts when there's a traffic accident or something stupid like that. Tonight, I was going to visit my brother and his wife, eat all the food they would put in front of me, play with their three kids, and maybe even have a beer or three. I knew there would be a lot of questions. But I was ready. Marcy hugged me tightly as I walked through the front door and grabbed my coat. David, how are you? We've all missed you. Well, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. The kids, after I handed out small gifts to them, went to play in the family room. Now let's get down to serious business. Marcy went straight to the main question. What the hell happened between you and Diane? Why did you leave? Gosh, Marcy, it's good to see you too. I wouldn't mind a beer if you guys happen to have one in the fridge. Paul looked at Marcy as if to say, I told you so. He went to the kitchen and came back with three bottles of beer. I sipped from a bottle under the stairs of my sister-in-law and brother. I began, So, I guess you want to know what's going on with me? What did mom and dad tell you? Marcy looked at me with some disdain for my evasiveness. They haven't said anything. I even tried talking to Diana, but she won't say anything. She wanted information from me, and of course I had nothing. All we knew was that you took a break from work and went off somewhere by yourself. So what the hell is going on? She put a fine point on the matter. I spent the next half hour telling them about the last five months in Reader's Digest format. I even went into some of the finer details of what I knew Diana was doing. I spared them the details of the investigator's report that revealed the extent of her entertainment. I omitted many details that they really didn't need to know. Besides, now that her affair had been revealed, it wouldn't bother them as much anymore. No matter. We had dinner and more beer and there were lots of questions about what I was doing on the road, and especially in Africa. I shared a few stories about my travels. I told them about Emma. I also told them that she was back in Berlin, working, and I was now back in Albany, working. So our lives will continue. After dinner, I told them that I was going to look for a place to live for a while until I sorted out my divorce and figured out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. The trip with Emma had opened my eyes to life, and I didn't think I could go back to living in a hospital and pretending to be happy. Returning to Albany reminded me of the collapse of my marriage and how I had failed as a husband, how easily Diane had left me for any available guy. I didn't say this to Paul and Marcy, but thinking about Diana made me feel like a complete wimp. She had deceived me so easily and for so long. I resolved never to allow myself to do such a thing again. That was one of the many conclusions I came to while traveling on my motorcycle through Africa. Another conclusion was that there are many good women in the world. Women with morals and integrity. Women who will be honest with you and if you don't suit them will tell you so. We'll talk to you. Not just have fun behind your back. If Diane didn't want to be married to me, why the hell didn't she just say so and we could have divorced and moved on? But no, she had to hide what she wanted. She had to lie to me. I took an Uber back to the hotel and got a good night's sleep. Tomorrow I had to look for accommodation. Diana. 
A person I work with informed me that David was back in town. They knew someone who was at the hospital and had seen him. I tried to call his mother and father, but predictably, I got the same answer I had gotten every time I called after David left. Back off. I was desperate and decided to stake out the entrance to the emergency hospital in the hope of seeing him. I spent four nights parked outside the hospital in a place where I could watch the entrance from. My goodness, how many people come and go in and out of that place? I didn't realize how busy it was. It seemed like every night there were ambulances constantly arriving here, bringing in the sick and injured. I got bored, so I took a book with me to read, and a snack. Unfortunately, on the second night I felt like going to the bathroom, so I got out of the car and went inside to find a restroom. I walked around until the security guy asked if I needed directions. I decided to just ask David. I was told that doctor's names are withheld unless you have an appointment, and then you have to go to the main entrance. I thanked him and left. On the fourth night, I got the gold. He was there. He was walking from the doctor's parking lot to the entrance. My heartbeat quickened, and I almost jumped out of the car and called his name. But I was too late. He disappeared inside the building. I got what I came for. I knew he was back in town. My next step was to try to talk to him and convince him to come home. David. It took a few days of searching, but I managed to find a nice apartment near the hospital. It was a few blocks away from where I lived. It was a pretty tiny one-bedroom apartment, but it was furnished, and all I had to do was buy linens and towels and stock up on food. I wanted a furnished apartment since I didn't want to buy furniture. I hadn't decided how long I was going to be here, so there was no point in buying a bunch of stuff that I would have to get rid of later. There was underground parking for my car, and I saw that the building had security, though no doorman. It didn't take me long to get back to work in the emergency room. Gunshot victims came in daily. Accidents and stabbings kept me busy. Heart attacks and strokes were commonplace because Americans were obsessed with the concept of obesity. Why people want to be overweight? Africans are almost never obese because they have much better nutrition. They have to eat less, and they realize they have to be as healthy as they can be because medical care is so scarce. That's fine. All those ambulance clients and their insurance companies were paying my salary. Two weeks after I returned to Albany, I called my attorney and asked for a meeting. Three days later, she and I discussed the details of the divorce from Diane. There wasn't much property or money to divide, and I told her that Diane could keep all the things we had in the apartment we shared with her. I told Diane this as I was leaving. Leanne had thought ahead and had already prepared a petition to dissolve the marriage. I told her to take action. I was very surprised that Diane had not initiated the divorce. I assumed that she was anxious to move on with her life and disengage with me. After discussing the details, I left and went home to my apartment. Once there, I realized that my life outside the hospital would be lonely. I needed a hobby. I called and found out that my motorcycle would not be delivered to me for a few more months, so I decided to look for another one. I spent some time on the internet comparing motorcycles and decided to go look at KTM. We have two stores outside of town that sell KTM motorcycles. I stopped by both on my day off, looked at what they had in stock, and settled on the 890 Adventure R. I asked them to bring a few accessories to outfit it for long distance riding. Racks, extra headlights, a quick shift adapter, and a few other little things all made the bike great for riding on both paved and dirt roads. It wasn't cheap, but what the hell else was I going to spend my money on? Diana. I got home and there was a guy in a suit standing outside the building. As I approached the entrance, he looked at his phone and then asked me, Diane Walters? Yes, who are you? He handed me a large envelope. You have been served. Before I could say anything, he stepped back and took a picture of me on his cell phone, holding the envelope, and then quickly turned around and walked to his car. Shit. I knew this would happen. David? So, a quick guide to New York State divorce law. You can file for a no-fault divorce in New York if you and your spouse have lived together for at least a year, or if the marriage has broken down irretrievably for at least six months. My attorney sent an email saying that Diane had been served with divorce papers. Leanne expected to hear something from Diane's attorney in a week or so. Until then, there was nothing that could be done. If Diane stalled, Leanne would file a petition with the court and get it granted after a year. So, in this case, Diane's prolonged affair represents an irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. If she objects to the divorce, the lack of living together for the last six months means that we must live apart for another six months in which case the requirements of the law would be met. Either way, the divorce will be final in about six months. Easy and simple. 
and then my doorbell rang. Diana. Okay, I did something I probably shouldn't have done. I followed David when he left the hospital at the end of his shift two days ago. I followed him to the apartment building where I assume he now lives. It's only a few blocks from our apartment. Well, mine, I guess. Now that I knew where he was, the only thing I lacked was the courage to go to him. I waited a few more days to work up the courage to change into an outfit I knew David liked. He always told me I looked good. It was skinny jeans with high heels and a white sleeveless blouse. I put my hair up in a ponytail just like he liked. Simple but elegant. If things went the way I wanted them to, the jeans and blouse could be removed quickly. I went to the store and bought a beer that I knew he liked. It was something called an IPA. I don't know what that means, but I know he likes it or liked it. I also brought a bottle of white wine for myself. A California Chardonnay. Taking a deep breath, I pressed the call button for his apartment on the panel in the entryway. After a few rings, he answered. Hi. David, is that you? Who's that? It's me, Diane, your wife. Silence. Can I come up? More silence. I'd like to talk to you. Silence again. After what seemed like an eternity, the buzzer sounded, and I grabbed the door before he could change his mind. I took the elevator to his floor, and on unsteady legs I walked to the door of his apartment. I knocked. David. I was not surprised when the intercom informed me that someone was calling at my apartment. There are always people in apartments. Girl guides selling cookies, Mormons selling Jesus and salvation, politicians selling getting elected or re-elected. But this was unexpected. It was probably a big mistake, but I let her in. When I heard a knock on the door, I waited a few seconds before opening it. I needed to take a deep breath and gather my thoughts and emotions. In the few minutes between her call and the knock, a hundred thoughts ran through my head. They were questions I was asking and anger I wanted to vent. Before opening the door, I reminded myself that I had moved on with my life. I am in a better place now than I was six months ago. I opened the door and there she was. The look on her face was, well, she looked good. She looked tired, but good. The woman who was my wife. Hell, she's still my wife. She was just standing there outside the door. I opened the door all the way and invited her in. Hi, Diane. What brings you here tonight? Hi, David. I wanted to talk to you. You've been hard to talk to lately and even harder to find. I turned and walked down the short hallway to the kitchen. I saw that she had a bottle of wine in her shopping bag. I brought her a wine glass and set it on the counter. She handed me the bottle. I had intended to pull the cork, but noticed it had a screw cap, so I opened it and poured her some. She pulled a can of IPA beer out of the bag and handed it to me over the counter. I wasn't sure if alcohol was good for me right now, so I told her. No thanks. I'm on hospital duty tonight. I grabbed a glass with ice and poured some Diet Coke. I pointed to the table for us to sit down. I decided that what we needed to talk about would be better discussed at the table, rather than pretending we were all having friendly and informal conversations in the living room. Now was as good a time as any to finalize this marriage, and we could get busy signing the papers, and our lawyers could have the judge stamp them and be done with it. Diana. David got straight to the point. No preliminary, how are you? Or, it's good to see you after all these months. No, he looked more serious than I'd ever seen him. My stomach tied itself into a knot when I started. You scared the hell out of me when you called the hotel and had Darren tell me you were dead. He didn't know who was calling, and of course he didn't recognize your voice. I was shocked when I got home and found your note and wedding ring. I pulled his gold wedding ring out of my bag and slowly placed it on the table. He just stared at it, not touching it. He wasn't going to go near it. It was poison to him. I tried to talk to your family, but none of them wanted to take the time to talk to me. Your father told me repeatedly to go to hell. I guess I deserved it. Ever since you left, I've been in some kind of hell. David hastened to reply. What did you expect me to do? I found out you've been having fun with Darren Ranger for a while now, and you thought I shouldn't do anything about it? What kind of idiot do you take me for? Never mind, I know what kind of idiot you think I am. It wasn't like that. How the hell was that? I was lonely. You were always in the hospital. You were never home, and when you were home, you were always exhausted and you never had time for me. So that meant it was okay to go and have fun with another man? It was okay to ignore our marriage? It was okay. Why the hell couldn't you at least talk to me and tell me you wanted to end our marriage? Why deceive me for so long? David stared at the table and refused to look at me. I couldn't blame him, could I? He took a drink, then asked, Did you sign the divorce papers? No, I don't want a divorce. 
I want us to be a complete family again. I am still your wife and I want to be your wife and the mother of your children. David laughed. You've got to be kidding. It was a statement, not a question. Are you completely delusional? No, I still love you very much. I'm still your wife and I'm not going to do anything else that would jeopardize that. I want you and me to live together again. I want us to be lovers again. I want to be the mother of your children. He looked at me wide-eyed. Jesus, woman, you're delusional. I'm not going to be your husband a day longer than I have to be. My lawyer is ready to go to court and file the divorce without you. You know that in New York it's enough for that to happen if we've lived apart for a year or six months, if it's proven that our marriage is irretrievably broken. You've done a good job of making it irretrievably broken. Now I've done my part. It's over. Realize that. You started all of this by entertaining your girlfriend for almost two years. I'm just finishing it. Honey, what does it take to get over a divorce and become a couple again? I don't want to be married to you, Diana. You broke us. We're going our separate ways now. I've had an amazing experience since leaving Albany, and I'm not going back to my old life. David, we can be good together, I know. No, we can't. You enjoy spreading your legs too much in front of other men for there to be any kind of relationship between us. This water has been poisoned. It's time for us to move on, Diana. It's over. It's over. You can go back to doing what you like. David stood up to tell me that our conversation was over. I finished the wine from my glass, set it down, stood up, and moved toward him to kiss him. If he'll only let me touch him, maybe we have a chance. If he remembers what it feels like for me to be around him, maybe he'll want me again. I walked right up to him, took his hand, and pulled him to me. I kissed him on the lips. I stayed as close to him as I could until he pulled away. It was only a second, but I realized it was the beginning. The last thing he said to me was, Don't forget to take this with you. He pointed to his wedding ring on the table. I took it, put it in my bag, and left his apartment. That's when I realized we were done. David was over. He and I would never have a life together. I loved the man, and I'd cast him aside for something that wasn't worth the price I had to pay. Darren wasn't a prize when you think about it. He got what he wanted, and all it cost me was a husband I didn't really want to lose. I'm so stupid. I deserved what I got. I need to sign the papers and get it done. I need to let him go. David? That crazy woman tried to kiss me on the way out of my apartment. I don't want anything to do with her. Now she wants us to pretend like nothing happened so we can be a couple again and have kids. Ah! She's not right in the head. That's not going to happen. The only thing that can happen, at least on my end, is that my lawyer will file a divorce and I can move on with my life. I needed a long, hot shower to wash the stink off me. So I did, and then I had a beer. Emma Fisher. I've been very busy here in Berlin editing hundreds of hours of video and putting it into context. The dubbing has been a challenge. I'm doing everything in English and a second version in German. Doing closed captioning is fun. It's a lot of work. The last month has flown by and I didn't notice how the time flew by. I sent David a few emails with short videos and a few pictures taken on his Honda while we were in Africa. He looks good in the videos. Even in the one where he threw his motorcycle. We both laughed a lot. I asked my friend to help me. Her husband works for the government and has access to information about people. She was able to get me some information about David before we traveled to Africa together. You'll remember that I wanted to find out if he was really who he said he was and not an imposter or serial killer. I was glad to hear that he was really who he said he was. So I asked Ingrid to ask her husband Nick if he could give me an update on David. I know it was a little mean, but I needed to know what was going on without asking David directly. I had my reasons for doing so. It took about a week, but she gave me what her husband was able to get. It seems David is back working in the emergency room and his lawyer has filed a dissolution of marriage, as it's called in America, with the court. That means divorce. The application was registered with the court a few weeks ago, so according to American divorce laws, he will be officially divorced very soon. That's good, because I have some important news for him. But before I tell him, I have to make sure some other things get done first. Business in America. I sincerely hope my news will please him. David. Yay, I'm divorced. It's official today. I have the paper in my hand. Thank God. Now I feel like I can move on with my life and do some of the things I want to do. I have a few things to figure out first. Emma calls and writes me letters all the time with news about her book and videos. She has sent me several videos, mostly showing me doing stupid things like throwing my bike. 
or me almost running into a small herd of cows on the road because I was looking at the sights and not paying attention to what was ahead. The cows and the bike weren't hurt, but my riding partner was laughing really hard. I told her about what was going on in my life. We talked on the phone several times. I told her about the visit Diane had paid me and how she hoped I would forgive, forget, and take her back. The disrespect with which Diane had treated me for so long was the deciding factor for me. I made my decision immediately after learning the extent of her affair. There was no going back, it seemed to me. It was what made me want to take a break from life. Emma listened to my rant, and I realized she was sick of my problems. She wanted to tell me something. She said she had to go, but she would send me an email in a day or so. Emma mentioned that she had an announcement for me in a couple weeks, but until then I would have to wait. I figured it was about her book. Emma, I need to tell David the news, but I'm not going to do it when he's still mad at his ex-wife. I need him to focus on me. Maybe a little more time, but not much more time. David, it's been a week since the divorce was finalized, and I'm at the Albany airport where I'm about to board a flight to O'Hare in Chicago, then Heathrow, and finally Berlin. It will be about a 15-hour flight, and I will arrive there tomorrow around noon. I need to see Emma. It's been almost two months I need to talk to her. I need to find out if there's anything left between us after our time together in Africa. If not, I'll go back to my life and figure out what I want to do. Doctors Without Borders is recruiting for hospitals and looking for doctors to work in different parts of the world. The pay isn't great, and I'll have to see how badly my family wants me to pay off the student loans they gave me, but I'll figure it all out somehow. I landed at Berlin-Brandenburg Airport, went through customs, picked up my bag at the carousel, and went outside to hail a cab. I booked a room at the Parkview Hotel, located right in the center of the city, in the Alexanderplatz district. It's a very nice hotel with all the modern amenities of a high-end hotel. Not at all like the little diners Emma and I had stayed in while in Africa. After I checked in, showered, and grabbed a bite to eat, my task was to find the building where Emma worked. I knew it was in the center of town, but I had no idea how to get there. Of course, I turned to Google to figure out where to go. I saved a map of downtown and went for a walk. It was almost 4 p.m. when I got to her building. I decided that if Emma didn't want to visit me, I would play tourist for the remainder of my flight home to the United States. I tried to deal with my own expectations about how I would react if I showed up on her doorstep unannounced, so to speak. Surprisingly, the building was only a few blocks away, and the road took about a 15-minute walk. I went inside and found the company's office in the directory in the lobby. I took the elevator to the floor and stepped out into the lobby. I approached the very attractive young woman behind the counter. She greeted me in German. I smiled at her and asked if Emma Fisher was here, and if I could see her please. The young lady was surprised to see me. Her eyes opened wide, and her carefully sculpted eyebrows raised noticeably. The American was asking for Emma. She grabbed her phone and made a call. After a few seconds of very quick conversation, she looked at me and said, Emma or someone else should be here in a minute. If you'd like, you can sit here and wait for her, she gestured to the soft leather chairs. When I sat down, she picked up the phone again and started talking, this time quietly, almost in a whisper, but very quickly in German, to whoever she was calling. I thought I heard the word American a couple times. She looked at me with the corners of her eyes. In the few minutes I sat there, several women who passed by looked me over from head to toe. I didn't realize what was going on. I was definitely under scrutiny. Do they really do this to every visitor? Are there really so few visitors here? Another very attractive woman came up to me. Doctor? Walters? I didn't have time to think, yes. Follow me, please. It wasn't hard to follow her slender backside, covered by a very tight short skirt, and the way her high-heeled shoes clicked on the polished granite floor. It was then that I realized I had told the receptionist that I was David Walters, not Dr. Walters. Hmm. I guess they know more about me than I realized. We walked down corridors through fancy glass and steel offices. A lot of women threw glances at me. I wasn't sure if it was because I looked out of place or because my fly was unzipped. I discreetly checked it. It wasn't. Was there an announcement over the public address system that a strange American was roaming the hallways? Hmm. After a long walk that seemed like it should have ended in the lobby, I saw Emma coming out from around the corner. A smile was shining on her face. She ran the last few steps to me, hugged me very tightly, and kissed me on the lips. There were a lot of people watching us now. My goodness, David, when did you make it to Berlin? A few hours ago. I went to the hotel and cleaned myself up before coming here. 
I didn't want to show up here looking like a vagrant. I figured if I did, the security people would throw me out on the street. I figured she'd ask why I was here. It would let me know if we were back to the status of acquaintances. That the hot nights we'd spent together in Africa were behind us, shelved as beautiful memories, and our real lives were ahead of us, on their own, separate. Emma spoke and the audience watched and listened. She took my hand and we turned and headed to the editing room where she was working. She wanted to show me what she was doing with the video she shot during her travels. Emma was wearing a very nice long and flowing black skirt, a long-sleeved white blouse, and shoes with heels, but not as high as many of the other women. From their gait and appearance, you would have thought there was a fashion show going on. Her clothes were a far cry from the motorcycle gear I was used to seeing her in. And she was naked. Naked was my favorite part. My best memories were split between being with a naked Emma and seeing a part of the world that had been a mystery since I was a small child. I liked the naked part best. I'm a man. I decided to just go with the flow and see how things went over the next few hours. We talked about her work on the book and the videos that will be part of it. Some of the videos will be on YouTube and most will be on the publisher's website. People will pay for a subscription to watch them. Do you have time to have dinner with me? I'd like to know what's going on with you beyond your book. And I'd like to share some things with you about what's going on with me. How long can you stay? Well, I can stay for a few days. My return flight is in three days, but I can easily change it if I need to. What do you have in mind? I didn't know where Emma was going with this. Whether she was asking me to stay longer or figuring out when she could get rid of me. I don't want to be like the remains of a fish dish, get rid of it quickly so it doesn't stink. I'd had enough of women who seemed to care about me, so I was on my guard. I want you to meet my family. I've told them a lot about you and they are looking forward to meeting you. You could knock me down with that answer. Oh, well, I suppose I can do that. I need to eat first, and I'd really like to try a good German beer. I can leave and meet you after you're off work. No, you won't. I'm leaving now along with you. It's been months since I've seen you, and I have important news after your news. As we walked out, people's heads turned to watch us go by. Emma held onto my hand. We walked back to my hotel. On the way, I asked her where she lived. She said in an apartment nearby. I wondered briefly if she had a husband she hadn't told me about. The last thing I wanted was to be the other person. It would have been easy enough to hide that kind of information when we were traveling in Africa. But when she got home, things would get very fast and serious. Reality bites you in the ass very quickly. I realized that I didn't know as much about Emma as I wanted or needed to know. I might want to meet her family. We got to the hotel and went into my room. Emma grabbed me, and we immediately started kissing with a heat that I hadn't felt in, in forever. Our clothes dissolved in a flash of hand and foot movements. In a flash, we were naked on the bed. My mouth and hands were reacquainting themselves with the woman who was magic to me. She seemed familiar and new to me at the same time. I missed her touch without realizing it. For the last few months since returning to Albany, I'd been holding my breath and didn't even realize it. Now I could breathe again. She seemed perfect to me. I couldn't believe that just a few days ago I'd been through a nightmare marriage and here I was already with a woman who made me feel human. I didn't want it to end. It was almost 9 o'clock when we surfaced to shower and eat. We didn't go far for food. The hotel had a good restaurant, and it was hard not to get good beer in Germany. Emma ordered a Diet Coke, which was strange because she likes beer. So why does your family want to meet me? I told them about you and our travels together in Africa. They are very eager to meet you since you come from the United States. I told them about my travels in Canada. My parents have been to the United States several times to visit my aunt in Florida. She lives there part of the year, I think, near Tampa. There are a lot of retirees there. The weather is nice, especially if you have arthritis. Emma laughed. I think she has it, and she loves the beach. She took a sip of Coke. We can go to my parents' house tomorrow if you want. We'd have to take the train. Will it take about six hours? Where do they live? In Ulm, in the south. My father worked as an engineer at Volkswagen. He developed production systems. I found it all very boring, but he could talk about it for hours. I'll let him tell you all about it. My mom is an accountant, but she's retired now, as is my dad. I'll call them and tell them we're here for a visit. I decided it was better to go with the flow, at least for now. The conversation turned to me. So you're now officially a free man? I smiled broadly. Yes, it is. And I have the paperwork to prove it.
I reached into my pocket and pulled out a piece of paper folded several times. I placed it on the table. I am a free man. Emma turned it around and looked at it. I've never seen one of these before. Congratulations. How does it feel? That's good. It was inevitable from the moment I found out she'd been having sex with her boyfriend for almost two years. She didn't want to be with me. If she wanted to, she wouldn't have done what she did for as long as she did. I shrugged and sipped my beer. She asked, what do you want to do now? There was a definite motive behind this woman's questions. She was dragging me several hundred miles to introduce me to her family. I was being tried to be evaluated. For months, we had a level of intimacy that is common among couples who are deeply committed to each other. I thought perhaps it was a German trait to quickly become sexually involved after getting to know each other. But no, it was something else entirely. I don't know until the end. I'm not sure how much longer I want to stay in Albany. They want me at the hospital and will pay me well, but there's too much history there and I need to find another part of the world to explore. You've instilled in me the urge to travel, you know. It's mostly your fault. I grinned at those words. Emma smiled back. We spent the night in my hotel room, and in the morning we went to Emma's apartment so she could pack. She made a few phone calls, and then we took a cab to the train station. I like the trains in Europe. They run on time. They are easy to get to, and there is much less of the paranoid security found in airports. We found our seats and settled into them. When we arrived in Ulm, we were met by a couple in their 60s, and I immediately noticed that Emma looked a lot like her mother. Same eyes and hair. But she had her father's smile. We met and went looking for her father's car, a Passat station wagon. In Europe, cars like that are called estates. Their house was old, but in excellent condition. The inside had been thoroughly renovated not so long ago with all the modern appliances and conveniences. I complimented her father, Carl, telling him that my father was a builder and would have very much approved of the work he had done. Carl seemed to grow even taller at this compliment. I was offered a beer and Emma went to get drinks for everyone as we sat down. The looks I was getting just screamed, tell us all about yourself. But they started with, so you're American. Where in America? I was going to try to exude as much charm as I could. They say that first impressions make a lasting impression. So I used all the manners my mother and father had taught me. Albany, New York. North of New York City, about two and a half hours away. Many nodded in response. Thank goodness Emma returned with the drinks. Beer for Carl and me, red wine for her mother, and a glass of ice water for herself. I started connecting the dots. So we sat in the living room, and as the silence became a little uncomfortable and her parents' eyes made laser holes in my head, I decided that if I wanted to survive the next hour, I needed to start a conversation. The best way to start a conversation is to ask people about themselves. So that's what I did. I knew they wanted to know everything about me, but I shifted my focus to them and used the little Emma had told me to get them talking about me. It didn't take Carl long to start the conversation. He went on and on about the excellent quality of engineering and Volkswagens and the other wonderful cars they make. Emma's mother. Maria was much more modest. She had worked for a large accounting firm for many years, doing mostly auditing. She retired when Carl retired, and they planned to travel, especially to warmer climes when they were older. They want to buy a vacation home in Spain or Greece, somewhere on the water where it's warm in winter. In Germany, it's too cold for them in winter. They deserve a vacation from the cold. They have friends who do the same, so they can find a place nearby. They would see. It was like my own family. Amazingly similar. My parents had bought a huge van with a big diesel engine and they planned to see the country. They also wanted to spoil their grandchildren. I know they thought I would add to their number in addition to my brother and his brood, but it didn't work out. It did. A large dinner was being prepared in the kitchen. Carl continued his review of the advantages of German engineering and German beer, and Emma watched me closely as I watched her. Carl did not fail to inform me that he was the reason Emma got into motorcycling in the first place. He has owned motorcycles for most of his adult life and still has a BMW 1200 in his garage. He also has a smaller motorcycle for local trips, but the big BMW is for long-distance travel. Maria often rides with her husband, and they spend several days at a time traveling. Not as long as they used to, but they still enjoy traveling long distances. Tomorrow he will proudly show me his motorcycles. Tonight we're having dinner. I felt like I was being scrutinized to get some sort of stamp of approval almost like a job interview. What are my goals in life? Where do I see myself in 10 years? That sort of thing. 
I was expecting to be given a different bedroom to Emma's, but was a little surprised to find that Maria had put fresh towels for both of us in the same bedroom. When we got into bed, I decided that there would be no special intimacy, so I even left my underwear on when I got into bed. Why are you doing that? said Emma, pointing at my boxers. Well, because we're at your parents' house, and... I don't think it would be right to get naked in their house. She laughed. They've slept together naked all their lives. Take that off. I haven't been around you for quite a few months, and I want you to be around me all of it. I whispered in her ear. How long? Emma didn't move from her seat. How long? Yes, and for how long? How much time for what? How many weeks? You do remember that I'm a doctor, right? I know what a pregnant woman looks and acts like. I'm pretty sure you're pregnant. There's a little bump starting to appear on your belly, so I'm guessing about three, maybe three and a half months. Oh my God! I counted and dotted the dots. The dot spoke no, screamed to me. I'm going to be a father. The woman on the bed next to me smiled at me and got up from the bed to get her bag. She pulled out a plastic test and held it out to me. Two blue stripes. My world changed in an instant. I did the math and it turned out the place was somewhere in St. Louis, or maybe Dakar. About three months. I saw a doctor in Berlin about a month ago. I have an ultrasound appointment in a week. I was ready to accept that Emma and I would move on, but not as lovers, but as friends. I know what time and distance do to relationships. What was once hot, crazy cools down in the light of day and reality, but a big part of me wanted there to still be a connection between us that wasn't broken. For it to be rekindled again. And it did. Just a minute. I crawled off the bed, went to my bag, and fumbled for something I had brought with me. I took this just in case. I took it in my hand and went back to bed. Emma sat up. She was still naked. I opened a small box and pulled out a ring. Will you marry me? Her face immediately brightened and her eyes widened. Yes. 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 I hugged Emma as tightly as I could until I remembered that there might be others who wanted to hear the news. I got up, dressed quickly, and opened the door to see two very surprised people standing in the hallway. We'll be right out. Emma dressed quickly and we all went into the living room to share the news. Of course, Maria knew her daughter was pregnant. Mothers always know these things. Carl, surprisingly, was not upset to learn that his daughter was going to marry an American. What can I say? Emma. Two days later, David and I returned to Berlin by train. We had a lot to do, and I wanted him to be with me at my doctor's appointment for the ultrasound. David spent some time on the phone with the hospital where he works, and of course, his family to share our news. His mother and father shouted over the noise of his brother, his wife, and their children. I heard words like, David is getting married, to that German girl. He spent all that time in Africa with. They were overjoyed at the news, and especially at the fact that I was pregnant. I was the next one to take a hiatus, but told the publisher I would work from home on the book part and do as much as I could with video. When we went in for the ultrasound, we were given the real shocking news. The doctor was running a wand over my abdomen to look for a heartbeat. It took a few seconds and David stared at the monitor. I saw the look on his face and then a smile. I knew right away that all was well. My doctor made a few buzzing noises and finally let us listen to the heartbeat. But here we were in for a surprise. I heard David say, oh, wow, and that surprised me. I had heard the machine make heartbeat sounds, but they were very fast. David looked at me. We're having twins. The doctor smiled. I cried. David, we were married in Berlin. Maria and Carl, a few of her friends, and a few people from the publishing house were present, about 30 people in all. It seems that the day I showed up at the office, word spread like wildfire through the women that the American Emma had talked so much about was here. They all had to actually see the doctor riding around on a motorcycle. There were a lot of decisions to make. We decided to go to Albany and look for a place to live for the time being. That way, we would be closer to my family, and we would have a place for Mary and Carl to visit as often as they wanted. I talked to the hospital and agreed to a shorter shift cycle in exchange for less pay. I was fine with that. I had a pregnant wife with whom I wanted to spend every spare minute. The next few months were hectic. Emma grew older. We found a nice four-bedroom house that would be a great place to raise children. It was only a short drive from my brother's house. Marcy and Emma were already busy decorating the house and planning what we would do when the family got bigger. My wife, Emma Maria Fisher Walters, gave birth to beautiful twin girls weighing almost six pounds each. Our life became a constant feeding, dirty diapers, and more feeding. I've forgotten what sleep was like. 
Maria and my mom are in a fierce competition to be the best grandma. My dad and Carl are also competing to see who can outdo who in design and construction. They have grand plans to renovate and expand my house. I can't keep up with them and I'm not going to try. David, just when you think life has kicked you in the balls, something good comes out of it all. I lost my wife because of her need to have sex with other men. A woman I loved and thought she loved me. But she wasn't and she lost respect for me and our marriage. She hid her infidelity from me for a long time and eventually it meant the end of our marriage. I felt guilty, but she made the decision to date another man. I don't think she realized that her actions had consequences. Meeting Emma was purely by chance. If I hadn't gotten a flat tire in Newfoundland while eating ice cream, I probably never would have met her. And where would I be today? Who knows? But I do know that meeting her was the best thing that could have happened to me. I have a new life, a wonderful wife, two children, and a future to look forward to. This is the life I wanted. Emma. I got the last words. Shortly after moving to America, I was walking with my sister-in-law, Marcy. We were shopping for children's furniture at an Ikea store. One woman was looking very intently at Marcy. She obviously knew who she was. Marcy turned and spoke to her. Hi, Diane. That was it. No, how are you? Short and to the point. I knew who Diane was, of course, but no one had ever shown me a picture of her. I knew she was David's ex-wife. The same one David had been having an affair with for a long time, until David discovered it. Hey, Marcy, how's it going? I turned around and my huge pregnant belly was in full view. I wanted to see what she looked like and no wonder she was quite pretty. Marcy looked at Diane and said in a tone that spoke for itself, Diane, this is Emma. She's David's wife. We're shopping for baby furniture. It left no doubt that she wanted Diana to know exactly what she was throwing away. She's having twins. With those words, Marcy turned, gently took my hand, and we walked away. Marcy said quietly under her breath, Slut. We picked up the purchases from the warehouse and helped Marcy and Paul load them into the truck. We had a snack and I got the full story from Marcy about Diane and how stupid she was. Much of this I already knew, but it was helpful to learn about it from a different perspective. The David's family never talked about her. She was old news best forgotten. That night, when David came home, we made love. I love being naked with him, and it always has the same effect on him. I dreamed of us riding motorcycles and traveling. I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. David's father and mother have a huge motorhome, and they have offered to lend it to us if we want to travel with the little ones. The motorcycles will probably gather dust for now. I'll think about it. It could be fun. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.